pray with me. Father God, this is your word and your will for your people. So interpret it into our lives and help us, Lord, to reflect it. We ask it through Jesus Christ. Amen. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. We're at week five in our series on the fruit of the Spirit, those things that define the character of the Christian life. And today we are looking at kindness. More than just being nice, the Greek word krestos is a complicated word with rich meanings. It can be translated as loving kindness, as goodness, as faithfulness, as mercy, even as piety. It's a, it's a busy word. Kindness in action can mean all of those things in context. Only one letter separates this word from the Greek word for Christ, Christos, which led to confusion about what the early followers of Jesus were really called. Some called them by the word Christianos, meaning followers of Christ, naturally, while others thought that they were Christianos, followers of kindness. You know, because kindness was such an integral part of the believing community, it was a natural mistake. But most significantly, this word, kindness, is used to describe the very character of God Himself. Of course, when you really look at the fruit of the Spirit, that, that list in Galatians, every one of those items reflects an aspect of God's own nature and character. All through Scripture, these traits are used to describe God Himself. God is love. God's very presence brings joy to all creation, and it's His absence takes away joy. God is our peace. God is patient. God is kind. God is good. God is faithful, even when people aren't. You get the picture. The fruit that we exhibit in our own lives is a reflection of God's own self shining through His people. After all, if the source of all love and kindness dwells within us, well, it would just make sense that we would be a little bit more loving and kind ourselves, just as our Father is loving and kind. So if we want to understand kindness in ourselves, we should look first at God's kindness and then ask a few questions. Who is God kind to? What does God's kindness look like? And what is the end result of that kindness? So instead of a description, I thought maybe a few pictures would help. She was worthless and she knew it. While no one had ever actually said the word whore to her face, she heard it whispered often enough behind her back. And as much as it hurt her, as much as she hated them for saying it, she had come to believe it too. She knew better than they what her days and her nights were like. She was damaged goods. After five marriages that brought nothing but pain, she had little faith in that institution anymore. And so she just had live-in boyfriends now. She couldn't accept that she could ever be worth anything more. Still, the weight of the contempt and the scorn that she endured each and every day, week in, week out, was more than just unpleasant. And so she just simply took to avoiding people altogether, like now. It was so blasted hot outside that she knew no one else would be out doing errands. So while they all sat at home in the shade, she seized the opportunity and braved the heat to do her work. The silence was almost comforting as she shuffled down the dry, dusty street. It wasn't until she drew near the well that she saw him. He was sitting so still 
He may have been mistaken as part of the stone he was resting against. If it weren't for those eyes. They sparked with intensity as they followed her every move. She'd never felt as self-conscious as she did now. She did her best to ignore him as she went about her work, staring purposefully at her hands as she drew the bucket up the well with a briskness that was motivated by her discomfort. Still, he was a Jew and a man, and, and it looked like a respectable one. And she was a Samaritan, a woman of, now how did they put it? Oh yes, ill repute when they were being kind. She had no reason to think he would even notice her, much less speak to her, unless it was to drop a snide comment or a veiled insult. But she was pretty used to that by now, although right now she felt more on edge than usual. Her hands couldn't stop shaking as she went about her work. Why did he keep staring at her? When he finally did speak, she nearly jumped out of her skin. Will you give me a drink, he said. For a moment, she thought he was mocking her. And something cracked inside. And she whipped her head up, eyes blazing to let him have it. But instead of scorn... His eyes held kind sincerity and something else. And so began a conversation that would turn her life and her world upside down. He seemed to know her backwards and forwards, all her faults and all her sin. But he spoke with gentleness and love. He met her as she was, gazed into her blazing pain and brought healing and hope, and dignity, and worth. He took her shattered image and reshaped it with grace, giving her back herself again, but infinitely more beautiful and valuable than she had ever felt before. Simple words, heavenly hope, and she was never the same. This is a picture of God's kindness. Here's another. He was worthless and he knew it. He didn't even bother to go near the town anymore. They'd only throw things at him. He had no place in polite society. And to some degree, it was just easier to be on his own. If he could call it on his own with the voices in his head. Do demons count as company? He skulked in the cemetery, filthy and naked, a wild thing in a wild place. He was actually most comfortable here with the dead. He envied their peace. He longed to join them in their sleep. But instead, his days were filled with rage and confusion. He screamed his pain, sobbing to the heavens and slashing himself with jagged stones as if the physical pain could somehow banish the pain within. But try as he might, he could not still the voices or silence his anguish or find even a moment of peace. No man was as miserable and then one day, he appeared. Even from a distance, he could feel his presence like, like a pillar of fire against the cold and darkness. And for the first time in his memory, all of the competing voices within were united in perfect harmony as they shouted their hatred and their fear. He stooped to pick up a large rock and with a shriek went bounding across the cemetery towards the invader. His, eye, his blazing eyes met those of the stranger, and he snarled his defiance as he brandished the stone against the sky. But his fury met those calm, kind eyes, and it was swallowed up like a candle in the ocean. He fell to his knees with a cry of despair. What do you want with me? And the man knelt in front of him and took him by the shoulders and looked deep within. 
compassion and kindness washed over him as the man said, be free. And just like that, his world, his life was reborn. This is God's kindness. One more to round out the portrait. He was worthless, and he knew it. Once he'd counted himself a soldier and took some pride in it, but he had no pride anymore. He'd been at this post for a few years, so he'd seen his share of unpleasantness. But this one made even his stomach turn. The Jew barely looked human anymore. The prof professional side of him made an assessment of the injuries and decided this man would not last the day. The human part of him just wanted to be sick. But he had a job to do. And so he picked up the hammer and the stakes and he went to work. He really hated this land. He hated these people. He hated his duty and he hated himself. But he knew what he was doing and it shouldn't take him long. And then he'd just be done with it. It was late morning by the time they had muscled the cross into place. Thick clouds were gathering and the sky was growing dark at the storm's approach. He knelt and he scooped up a handful of dust to scrub the blood from his hands and then cursed and spat as a gust of wind blew some of it into his eyes and his mouth. A flash of light and a crack of thunder drew his attention heavenward and he looked square into the face of his victim. Though the eyes were blurred with pain and fatigue, they still pierced straight through him and they held him captive. But it wasn't anger or fear or even hatred that held him. He'd seen those things before in, in the faces of his victims. And he'd learned how to brush those things aside. But he was totally, completely unprepared for what he encountered now. Those eyes, those pain-soaked eyes held kindness compassion, even pity. And they pierced him to his very soul. He stood there alone as if he was the only human being left on earth. And those eyes burned him with their kindness. The cracked, swollen lips parted and the man spoke. Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. The words hit him in the gut like a fist and he fell to his knees at the foot of the cross in the fading light, his eyes still fixed on the dying man. Two questions circled in his mind. Who are you? And it led him inexorably to the second. What have I become? If you want to know what kindness is. What kindness should look like in your life. Look to the kindness of God. If you want to know the kindness of God, look to Jesus Christ. Look at who Jesus loved and what shape that love took. Look at the way he treated others. These are just a few of the many encounters that Scripture records. Jesus sought out sinners, sought out broken people, the sick, the marginalized, the forgotten, those that everyone else had written off. Jesus had dinner with prostitutes and tax collectors. He talked with those excluded by most with those hated by all. Jesus touched lepers, welcomed sinners, loved liberally and gave freely. He didn't excuse sin, but neither did he shrink from it. He didn't put up with evil, 
but neither did he flee from it, nor did he condemn those trapped by it. He embodied the kindness of his Father as he reached out to the most vulnerable of society that he might save them. He did it not because they deserved it. Not because they could make it worth his while. But because they needed it. Simple as that. And he taught us, his people, to do the same. You know, I have to say that I honestly think that the church is really, really good at showing kindness. I really do. I think it's one of the things that we are good at. Christians tend to be very kind people to each other. And that's good. Really, it is. Paul says that, that kindness should be at the heart of our communal life. But being kind to one another is just the start. It's just a warm-up. Jesus Christ told us that we shouldn't expect any reward for being nice to each other. That should be a given. But look at who Jesus wants us to be kind to. You know, I wonder who the modern-day woman at the well is. How about that demoniac? howling in the cemetery? How about the soldier daily crucifying those that had never harmed him? Who are they now? You know, Jesus taught some radical things, but love your enemy is perhaps the most radical of all. To show kindness to those who show you unkindness. To do good to those who do you evil. To give to those who cannot repay you. These things, he says, these things are where you'll really find blessing. These things will show your character to be like that of God himself. Because, and this is the key here, because it is this exact thing that God has done for you in Jesus Christ. Be merciful just as your Father is merciful. Be kind just as your Father is kind. Show your character to be like that of God Himself. That's what Jesus asks of His followers. And then, as if it weren't enough, He had to show the extent of God's kindness as He took up His cross to save us all. We who, Paul says, were enemies of God, doomed to destruction, you know, he set that kindness bar pretty darn high. So that's the first two questions right there. Who are you to be kind to? Everyone. Especially those that most offend you. Those that most hurt you. And what's that kindness to look like? Well, it looks a lot like the kindness of Christ. And that can be anything from having a conversation with a woman at the well to laying down your life so that others might live. Now, what's the purpose of God's kindness? Well, Ephesians gives us a two-part answer. The first is that God simply wants to save, wants to rescue, wants, wants to make His kindness a centerpiece throughout the coming ages, a cosmic example, and that He wants to, to use you, your life, as that example of kindness. First, as a recipient. For you were once enemies of God, but now you are saved by grace in order that God might display in you the complete, the total riches of His grace in Christ Jesus, poured out in kindness. This is a character thing. God wants to display His own character in showing kindness to a completely undeserving people. To bless us and strengthen us and grow us. But He's not done there. God also wants to develop us to be promoters of that very same kindness. To a world that is just 
as undeserving as we ever were. For we were created in Christ Jesus to do good works, to pass it on, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Salvation leads to a display of God's overwhelming kindness, leads to the sharing of that kindness with others. We are made to represent God's kindness. There must always be both parts. They are related. Let me try and bring this home. Turn in your bulletin. Where is it? There it is. In the box. Westminster Presbyterian Church. Our mission. I think this is a fair representation of what I'm trying to con convey. Look at the first part. Inspiring committed Christians to grow in the wisdom of God's word. Well, that's pretty nice stuff. It's a vision of God's kindness to us. To, to seize hold of us, to grow us, to develop us as a community of believers. But if it goes no further than that, then we've frankly missed the boat. If we never get outside ourselves, we have cut out the very heart of Jesus' teaching and missed God's kindness to the world. And so we must have the second half. And to become living examples of Christ's love for the world. What does Christ's love look like? God's kindness reaches out always reaches out into the world. And it is for this same thing that God has prepared us. God calls every one of us to be an ambassador for Christ. Each one of us is called to be a missionary in our own community, in our region, and in our world. Not just to support mission, but to be God's mission in the world. God created us for a purpose. To do good works, which he has created, prepared in advance for us to do. It is how God's kindness is spread and how this world is transformed and redeemed. These two elements must flow out of one another or we have missed the gospel and traded God's kindness for a comfortable lie. You know, you may pass that lonely woman on her way to the well every single day. I mean, she might look a little bit different in her well-pressed business suit, but it's still her. You may see that crazy guy screaming his anguish amongst the, the tombstones. His demons might be different, but just talk to him. Go ahead, talk to him. It's the same guy. You see every day the blind and the lame, the leper, the outcast, the forgotten, the lonely, the lost. Every single day we pass them by. And if we don't stop and show God's kindness, who will? This is what we were made to do, brothers and sisters. And what a glorious thing to be instruments of God's grace to transform and redeem a broken, hurting world with our very lives. I want to end with some words by a 19th century Quaker, Stephen Grellett. He said this, I expect to pass through this world but once. Any good thing, therefore, that I can do, or any kindness that I can show to any fellow creature, let me do it now. Let me not defer to neglect it. For I shall not pass this way again. God's kindness has reached into the very brokenness of your life and sees hold. Now, allow your life to reach into the very brokenness of another's and seize hold, seize hold. 
just as your Father has seized hold of you. Let's pray. Lord God, can we ever truly fathom the depth of the kindness you have poured out in Jesus Christ, your Son? I say no, Lord. But let me learn a little bit more every day, Lord, and, and let me share it. I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.